City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday night, you're here in Com Center with Drew Breezy. Drew Breezy, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I, I'm just, I, I'm wondering. There's, I, I just detect a, uh, just like a, a thread of morose in your voice. Uh, perhaps it's a, uh, like a shimmer of fear. I don't know quite how to describe it, but I'm sure the podcast listeners are picking up on it. What, what is it? What is it that's bothering you, little buddy? Uh, St. Patrick's Day always gets me down. What are your plans for St. Patrick's Day? It's St. Patrick's Day Eve, and as you can see, I am wearing the traditional St. Patrick's Day Eve, which is a black bomber jacket with a black shirt. You look stunning as always. My eyes can barely <clears throat> accept the gift I'm being given, Drew. We are given uh, gifts of a bunch of people in the chats tonight. I am so pumped to see everybody in here. It's it's a lot of the usuals. It's a lot of new people, but Chief Keith is in here, and I see Abby, and uh, both of those people have something in common. And what might that be, John? Uh, they both have podcasts that are friends of ours. I know that uh, Abby uh, does on being a police officer. She just released an episode on Wednesday that fans want to hear. Abby, by the way, uh, on being a police officer, ha now officially has the uh, first ever hat trick. Uh, she has interviewed myself and our friend John uh, gave a, uh, and I'm, I'm not even joking about this. You've got to listen to the Jonathan Bates episode. It is uh, so, I don't know, I don't want to say revealing, both of them. She's an incredible interviewer. She just pulls it out of you. She just knows she how, to, she's how, to, a, how to get it out of you. She's now, a pneumatic jaws of life, Halligan tool of, inter of, of interviewing right. people. She'll get inside of you and figure out what's going on and you reveal things you didn't even know about. Very good it's it was the goal of any uh interview or interrogation of mine to just get into that to get into the person's head and walk around a little bit and shine a few uh lights with my cave helmet and kind of see what's going on up there and she does a really good job of doing that so please on being a police officer download listen um and support abby because she supports us she loves you i guarantee it um, and also chief Keefe, who's in the chat invited me on his podcast. I think it was supposed to be Eric and I, but Eric, uh, what they, what they call in, uh, the Western part of the country flaked. And so it was just me and, uh, the three guys from, um, one more and I'm out of here. Another great podcast for you to listen to. Uh, but we, we had a good time talking about current events and we had a blast. We did a lot of talking as well about, uh, Jonathan Bates in his uh, absence, and uh, as is the case, a as is the conversation in most um, most dinner tables in America these days, uh, everybody talks about Jonathan Bates. So what I'd like to do first is go to, uh, we're going to talk with Davey. He's still in the Navy. He probably will be for life. How are you, Davey? David? Hey, I'm good, Drew. Hi, John. How are you tonight? Uh, I'm great, David. Terrible. Uh, okay. Thank you for asking. <laughs> but I'm great. <laughs> oh, hey, by the way, Andrea's in the chats. We all love Andrea from uh, Andrea. Uh, Andrea Uplate is the um, uh, Night Shift is the podcast. Andrea Uplate is the Instagram channel. Both are her uh, radiance and eminence. So please make sure you uh, listen to what she has to say because it's brilliant. Usually uh, it's a fun time on Tuesday nights. So, David. Uh, there was an invitation in my um, in my DMs for you as a resident of the San Diego area to come in to a classroom and talk to the young children about, uh, I don't know, you could scare them about drugs or whatever you wanted to do. So uh, I can certainly hook you up with that. If you want to send me the DM, I could send you that information. Perhaps the, the same person has reached out to you. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't checked my DMs in a while. You know, kind of like uh, John, I just don't know who's sliding in. You know, never look at it. It's it's all popularity, and I understand it. You're, you're growing even more popular 
uh, by every word that you uh, actually you're growing more popular by every second that you let go before answering any of these questions. So what's the weather like in uh, Southern California right now? Well, it finally cleared up. It's been, it's uh, it rained pretty hard last two days. So now it's 74 and sunny again. Awesome. Uh, today, uh, today I was out on the water. Uh, very disappointing. You know, some people knew uh, what I was doing going on today. And uh, let me just tell you, uh, I was not beat up. Uh, I was very uh, dissatisfied. And uh, it was, uh, unfortunately, it was a very successful uh, mission set. Well, that's always good news. And it's uh, it's very obvious that you made it back or we wouldn't be having this discussion. And we always uh, applaud that. John, do you have any questions for David? Um, just uh, you ever fired one of those uh, Phalanx close-in weapon systems guns? <laughs> Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't. I don't work on that. But uh, no, I actually had a question for both of you. Uh, oh, something came up uh, military wise, and I wanted to see what you all thought about it. So, a uh, a supervisor quoted uh, probably a non well. He quoted the Desert Fox, and he got a lot of backlash for it. So Edwin what Rama. I wanted to ask was, what was all? Yeah. Uh, what is y'all's opinion on someone quoting a an individual in history who may or may not be savory? Is you know, even if it is a good teaching point. Well, we we can ask Kanye about that if you'd like. Uh, he just had a little run in with that. <laughs> what what do you what say you, John? Because you're the history buff of the show. You were actually in charge of history of uh, on uh, Com Center with Drew Brees. Well, you're I did know that the Desert Fox, his real name was Edwin Rommel. I think that counts for something. Um, I, I remember there was uh, some, there was kind of a kerfuffle about it. At one point, the United States had an operation called Operation Desert Fox, and some people were upset because they thought there was named after the famous uh, German general. I say, you know, if you're a wise person, you're going to learn from whoever can teach you something. Now, it doesn't mean you don't discriminate. So if uh, Edwin Rommel gives you some excellent ideas on leadership or tactics, you can maybe apply those things. If he tells you, you know, kind of like how you should uh, uh, treat people in terms of like, you know, putting them into an oven or something, you could say, well, you know what, Edwin, that's really not good advice. And uh, I'm not going to take you up on that one. But thank you for the deck, the tactics about fighting in the desert. And uh, so I'm just going to discriminate. I think it's just stupid when we when we wholesale, you know, regard or disregard someone based on everything in their life. Uh, so if somebody has something that you can learn from, you should learn from it. You shouldn't discount any sources. It's not like. Uh, it's not like we're at, we're asking for uh, you know Dr. Joseph Mengele. We're not asking him to, you know to anything medical that he obtained unethically. If Edwin Rommel has some wisdom for us, I don't think there's a problem with using and applying it ethically. And, and things change. I mean, there there are atrocities that will that will always be atro atrocities, but there are, there are times when things change in history. So perhaps uh, the approach of some of the people in history. Uh, was well intentioned at the time, but just turns out later in life that it wasn't so well intentioned, or vice versa. So, um, well, it's it's the bias of presentism, you know. And I don't want to say that there's no such thing as right and wrong, and I don't want to equivocate. Certainly on the Holocaust, I mean that's beyond the pale. But um, you can't just say, well, you know, that that person who lived a hundred years ago had some problematic ideas, so they just never had a single worthwhile thought in their head. And it's okay if you don't want Edwin Rommel or. Joseph Mengele or Adolf Hitler to be your guidepost for life. We certainly have other people that can do that for you. But if someone's going to quote somebody like that, maybe don't get bent out of shape about it. I, th I think if you're going to get bent out of shape about quotes. Maybe you don't have enough problems in your life. David, I can't thank you enough. I always, uh, I'm always uh, encouraged yet bewildered uh, that you're sitting in the call queue and we're having private discussions and probably saying bad things about you until uh, Josh jumps, uh, you know, Josh, uh, our call screener, Dead Like Media, jumps all over us and says, oh, no, he can hear everything you're saying. Uh, so thank you for keeping the nation safe. Thank you for keeping our secrets safe, because by proxy, you're keeping the nation safe by doing that. And get in front of those kids and uh, quote General Rommel to those children. That's my suggestion to you. All right, Drew. John, both of you, keep up the good work. 
Yeah, see you Thank later. You, Thanks for everything. We have tonight a packed show. I want you, if you're uh, so inclined, to call uh, 848-266-6911. That's 848-COM-911. Nice. As you can hear, our phone lines are wide open at the moment. They won't be for the rest of the show. I guarantee it. We're all going to be uh, very busy in a minute uh, with all of these calls that pour in during the show. Uh, however, what we got, we we do have, we actually do have a pretty packed show tonight. Uh, here's what I was going to tell them, John. We uh, we're going to review uh, a uh, Tucson uh, area shooting that occurred uh, for a mentally ill subject. It's got a uh, it's got a few lessons within, so I think it's worthy of our time. But first. I'm going to go, I'm going to talk a little bit about a case here in Florida. It, it occurred in Volusia County, which is not near me, but uh, apparently what happened was there was a two year, two year old girl that was found unresponsive in a pool. Uh, she's recovering after her family members uh, pulled her from the water and started CPR with the guidance of a 911 supervisor, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office said. After receiving a frantic 911 call, deputies in Volusia County Fire Rescue responded to a home in De Leon Springs. They said the two-year-old two -year -old girl was found face down in the above ground pool while a family member was watching several children and their mother. I really wish I had the audio and video for this. Oh, wait, I do. Now, here's the thing. Uh, it, it is a very frequent, uh, it, it, people here in Florida have pools. I mean, you know, I know that they do across the United States. I know that there are rivers and lakes um, that you're used to that, uh, that, that that are all over the country. I get it. There is an inordinate amount of um, uh, of drownings here in Florida. It's a very dangerous thing. It's not. It's a year round thing because the pools are generally open year round. I mean, it, it was it was relatively cold out this morning. It was in the high 40s here, uh, but I sat out by my pool you know, <laughs> drinking coffee, watching the world wake up as I do every morning. So the pool's not covered. There, there's no weatherization of, uh, you know, for, shut down for the season in Florida, unless you're in extreme North Florida. So uh, as a result, with the high elderly population and the high uh, juvenile population, you know, infant population, th there's a lot of um, and we can't dis discount the autism spectrum. There, there are a lot, a lot of drownings uh, in the area. It's a, a drowning call is a very traumatic thing for a dispatcher to have to listen to because of the sheer terror that the parents and or the, the, the people that are in charge of the kids at that moment are going through. It's a, it's a very traumatic thing to watch, to witness. I mean, I've, I've been there when they were doing CPR on the kid. Um, it, it's, it's it's hard to watch, but it's even harder to listen to. So I'm going to give you that warning before I play it. The baby out of the water. Yes, we grabbed her out. Okay, is the baby breathing? No, she's not. Okay, how how long was she in the water? We don't know. Okay, is anyone there trained in CPR? No, we're not. Okay. <laughs> they're on the way. They're on the way. I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Do we know how long the baby was in the water? We don't know. Okay, is this a pool? Oh, she's breathing. Wait, is she breathing? Turn her on her side. Turn her on her how, side. How, old, how old is the child? How old is the child? She's two. Okay. Turn her on her side. We won't need water to drain out if she got any in there, okay? Let's make sure. Let's make sure she's breathing. Let's make sure she's breathing. And listen to me. Okay, I'm going to give you instructions, okay? Can you put the phone on speaker? So very common. Uh, I don't I, like, I, I think she said something similar to, I, I can't do your instructions, just hurry up, which is something that a 911 operator hears all of the time like they just want uh, the officer to teleport uh, what happens next is the body cam of the officer is overlaid with the audio from 911 which makes it a good visual but if you're listening on a podcast uh, you'll just be hearing the rest of the call and turn the baby over oh my god get the Hi, hello yes oh uh, what yes 
Okay, I want you I want you to turn the baby over and let it see if there's any water. We want to drain the water out, okay? She's on her side right now. Okay. All right. Put put the baby flat on her back. More more importantly, you can hear that engine uh, of that patrol car. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but it's it's they're moving. Right on, on a hard get away, get away. Uh, on a hard surface. On a hard okay. Surface. Yes. I want you to take one hand, place it on the center of her chest between the nipples, and to press down to a depth of one inch. Okay. We're going to do thirty compressions. Okay. Go ahead and count with me. One, two. I want this for this rhythm. One, two, three, four, five, One, six. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirty-two, thirty-seven. It was that eight. Okay, so stop and stop and start over again at one. It'll be easier to count. Okay. One, two, three, four. Nine. There's a deputy coming on scene. Don't stop until someone takes over. Keep going. Thirty-two. The deputy has arrived. Seven, eight, nine, the deputy ten, is running towards nine, the pool two, three, to four, find the man five, giving CPR five, and counting. Don't, don't stop compressions until the responders on scene. Police is here, police is here. Okay, all right, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect. Let them take over. Come on, you're okay. Come on. In the interest of time, I'm going to move it forward. Uh, eventually what happens is other officers show up. And they start asking the, the female officer that was there first, uh, you know, what do you need? She said, uh, the, the baby's breathing, Every, it, the baby's back breathing. So uh, thankfully in this situation, um, the child turned out to be okay. They transported the baby to the hospital. There have been, um, the most recent one that I responded to, would, like in my waning days as a, as a shift commander on the day shift, um, I thought certain there's no way that, that this child was going to survive. I mean, it had been at the bottom of the pool for, you know, who knows? Even if the parents estimated three minutes, then you could probably triple that because they don't, nobody keeps track of time like that. And I'm sure it does seem like an eternity as well. So, you know, we always had this difficult task. Are we going to treat this like a death investigation or is it just a drowning or, uh, and there's no such thing as just a drowning, I understand, but. Um, and that little, that little girl survived, uh, just b based on the life-saving efforts of the deputies. And of course they're just sustaining life until people like chief Keefe arrive, uh, with the machinery that they have that actually, you know, does the compressions and stuff. John tough call for the, uh, the supervisor there. Yeah. Uh, anytime a, a child's involved, a child's in peril, um, uh, changes everything. Um. I haven't had too many of these, although I have had some. But uh, I remember one time I, I had a, a situation like this where a child wasn't breathing, and uh, there's a, it's kind of a, an administrative anomaly where my 911 agency actually kind of overlaps some services with another area. And so I was on the 911 call, got it transferred up to the area it's supposed to be in, but I. Uh, I stayed on the call because I wanted to, to to know what was going on or communicate with the person if I needed to because I was sending units. So I sent units kind of out of my area into an area they don't normally go to. And I'm talking about sheriff's deputies. Uh, and, um, you know, they were ready to kick down a door to get into where they needed to get to to help a child. And it's not that they don't care about everyone like that. It's just anybody who's a parent, I'm sure, understands this. But I'm really just any, anybody who's decent, you know, like kids you fight for you fight harder for them you find a special reserve to kind of reach down into and you get invested super quick because you know children are always innocent and and they're they're precious so and uh you know just how long can a baby hold their breath certainly not nine minutes certainly not three and when you're in the comm center and when you're sending that call you'll send anybody you know you don't care who who it is anybody there when they're when it's a person not breathing literally anything can help that situation at that point they can't be any worse because they're, 
they're dying. So anytime where you have a call where uh, a kid comes out alive and well, it's, it's amazing. That's going to buoy that 911 supervisor and remind them of why they got into the job for a long time. There is a comment, and there, there's a comment that I'm reading. It says uh, the compression board they bring is almost violent, which is which is true. I mean, it, it's it's it is traumatic enough that uh, a family has seen the 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 child, or maybe a family member has pulled the child out of the water. Uh, but when they bring, you know, it's just tubes and pl- like the wrappers from the plastic from the um, from the bags and stuff, and uh, IVs and machinery, but that, but the board they bring to do the compressions is, is like a very, um, it's just, it saves lives. There's no question about it, but it's very systematic and it's very, uh, loud, you know, and it's, it's just, it, it's just a surreal, it, it'll send you into a different sphere, a uh, sphere of reality. I can't imagine what it would be like for a firefighter or a paramedic to, to have to admit it, administer that. So, well, C- um, CPR in general is not like what most people think. It actually drives me nuts when I watch movies and TV shows and they're doing this gentle, barely there CPR or I'll see a medical show where a doctor's doing CPR to a patient who's in bed. And it's just, it's like real CPR to be effective, particularly on an adult, it's going to be violent. You know, like if you're worried about breaking ribs, it's like, like I said, nothing can make that situation worse. They're already dying. And so you uh, you encourage whoever's there, the rescuer, trained or untrained, to to get in there and and make a difference. And it's a brutal process. I do see our friend Enrique from uh, Florida in the uh, call queue. I really want you to stick around, Enrique, but we got to get to this one thing first. On a major call for sir. I want to go to the voicemail bag of uh, hey, John. somebody that uh, somebody sent the video. Thank you. Oh boy. Hey, hey Drew We're and John. All kinds of trouble now. Hey, John and Drew. This is Jim from Florida. Uh, just a quick question. I uh, just wanted to get your take on the use of debriefs on a major call for service, including dispatch and their participation. Great show. Thank you. Thank you for that call, Jim from Florida. Um, what, what's your take on that, John? I have uncharacteristically mixed feelings about it, Drew, and I'm guessing it's a different take than you. Uh, the yeah. take that you're going to take, I'm sure, is that dispatchers need to be involved because we go through, uh, you know, trauma through what we witness through the experience, not visually, but through what we hear. I I think that it is important for dispatchers to get a debrief. And I guess depending on your personality, your agency or the incident, it might be helpful to have firefighters, police officers, rescuers and, and dispatchers all together. Uh, certainly from a camaraderie standpoint or a shared trauma standpoint, you know, um, but I guess I would say this, I've been invited to some critical incident debriefings before and I, and, and I thought to myself, man, I should go to this. This is, this will be important for me. But I just thought my experience is so different from a firefighter's. It's so different from a police officer's. And it wasn't necessarily that I felt like I didn't belong, but, and this is just on me, but I thought, uh, I thought I would go and that no one would, uh, that, those guys wouldn't understand what I went through and that, you know, not that it was all about me, I guess, but it, uh, it's just such a different experience that, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure maybe what you can get out of that. And maybe I just need to, unfortunately, I'm going to be put in a position where one's going to come up against, maybe I should just go to the next one. And that way I can tell you more, maybe more informed what I think about it. Yeah. I, I, I would strongly encourage you to go because you don't realize uh, what, what I didn't realize was, um, we, we we had a major incident we in a debrief after what i didn't realize was who was affected and how and why and when people are in the same room and we're all kind of commiserating because of the the trauma that you're dealing with you don't uh hearing it from other perspectives is uh kind of um healing in a sense it it, it just it kind of brings you all together uh it kind of shows that you're all in this together and that uh, people need to know that this deeply affects you as well. Like this, and I, I can't stress this enough for the profession of the telecommunicators, 911 operators. Um, I, I'm not, I, I'm going to tell you something um, that again, in once a week, I say this, I'm not trying to break my arm to pat myself on the back. 
I did a research project when I was up there about first responder or about dispatcher traumas, specifically about this trauma in the civilian sector, because I included child protective investigators, but it was mainly focused on the communications center people because that's where I worked. Um, and you're right, John, like the, the, um, being an audible witness, the trauma is no different than being a visual witness. The only difference is the danger being present when you're a visual witness. If you're, if you're a firefighter, like the roof can collapse on you. Hearing somebody burn alive is the same thing. And whether you they're watching it or whether you're listening to it, there's no difference in, in that. It's just, just a different sense that's being used in your brain. So what I decided to do was, um, uh, you know, I noticed a pattern of, of a lot of um, disciplinary issues, and I also noticed a pattern among the supervisors, and I'm not downing them. I also noticed a pattern among the supervisors of disciplining the, the, the uh, operators and, and 911 dispatchers and uh, without asking questions like, why, you know, why did this happen or, or what's going on in your head or, why, you know, why did you do what you did? I mean, they would send me pictures sometimes of people, th 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 for example, we're going way on a tangent here, D buckle in everybody. For example, they sent me uh, a request to do an IA investigation on, a, on an employee because they caught her sleeping on the midnight shift. And it was complete with iPhone pictures of her sleeping at her console. And I asked a simple question. It's a very simple question. What did you say to her when she woke up? Did you ask her why she was sleeping? And they said no, and they protested, and they were like, "No, no, we caught her red-handed, basically." And they, and it was almost like a celebration at first that they got it on film and blah blah blah, like it's going to make the case. So I said, "Do me a favor and ask her what, why she was sleeping." And sure enough, she was not only contrite for sleeping. You know, yeah, you caught me. I'm not going to, but here's the deal. I'm taking care of both of my elderly parents. My 15 year old kid has gone off the rails. I, I can't be here during the night because, um, you know, obviously I'm here <clears throat> and I can't be there for them during the day because I'm trying to sleep. So I was running on about an hour of sleep that day. And, and, and you got me, I, I'll take whatever you're going to give me because that's what they're conditioned to do. Just get slapped in the face and move forward. Um, so obviously I said, we're not, we're not disciplining anybody over this and we're, we're going to start asking more questions. So uh, what I had them do was as supervisors at the conclusion of a traumatic incident, whether it was a day or what uh, immediately after go over there and make contact with them and, and, and don't even try to draw anything out of them. Just say, look, I'm here. If, if, if you need to take a break or if everything's okay, I wanted it documented in a spreadsheet that, that at least that happened. And then in a day or two follow up, maybe two or three shifts later. And the purpose for that was, th th I, I really and truly, it, it was after I had done the research project and I really and truly didn't know what the full reasoning that I had, but I just knew it was important to kind of start collecting data. And um, it just kind of uh, morphed into, and from what I understand, they're still doing it now that I'm gone. It's It's their business, whether they do it or not. But uh, I think it's a good idea from the human nature side, but um, what I was looking to do was when you come at me with a um, with a disciplinary case, I want to I want to match it up to the level of trauma that they've been exposed to over the last six months or eight months, and it's not to excuse their behavior, but it's certainly to to mitigate some of the 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 disciplinary issues. Like we, we should not be as a communication center boastful that we had the number one amount of IA cases that ran through uh, IA last year. That that should that's not a badge of honor. Um, that's a slap in the face to the people that work up there. And you have to have rules, and they have people have to follow them. And and I get that. But there's there is definitely another side of the story. And in a profession where we're trying to hold on to as many people as we can, uh, perhaps we need to figure out a way to draw some of this trauma out, or to at least show that they're loved what do you think john well i mean you know I, I never i'm not an admin person so i never got into like disciplinary stuff or internal investigations but i'll just say about sleeping i mean it's something you've got to address but i mean you could sit down in your office and say look we know you were asleep 
and uh, I'm sure you you understand why that's a bad thing. I was right, and um, they're just going to nod their head because, of course, they know. And so I say, like, so I'm sure you can agree with me that this shouldn't happen again. And it's like, I guess you got to document that or whatever, because in case it is a persistent issue, then you say that it happened. But there's no reason to discipline because they already know not to do that. You know, corrective action is designed to change someone's behavior, but they already know not to sleep. It's, it's a given. I don't know why you would even bother. Um, it's not an. Uh... It, it wasn't a matter of missing 911 calls either. It was just a matter of uh, they were nodding off at their console. Well, okay. I'll say this too, but the person who's standing mm -hmm. over them taking their picture, you know, well, shit, what a <laughs> shitty coworker. You know, you, you're sitting there, you know, snapping a picture. I'm sure of somebody they didn't like thinking that they were going to do them in or whatever. It's like, well, we, we have actually to actually, it was actually it was a supervisor. And I, the first thing I asked was, well, did you? reach your arm out and wake her up yeah make the sure they're okay no. like what if they're having a diabetic thing you don't even know but it's all about it's all about catching somebody and sometimes and i don't mean to like you know i was a supervisor too but sometimes it's almost like you get a notch on your belt for like the perceived you know litter that you're cleaning up around the center you're saying well i'm taking care of this and i'm solving this problem when maybe you just need to be a, be a better leader and take care of your people to begin with you know maybe relieve them so they can go outside and yeah. have a refreshing cigarette or whatever is going to wake them up and sit at their console for five minutes. You can do that too. I, I'm going to tell you too, though, because I want to make sure that you all understand this. The people that I worked with, the, the supervisors and managers and general manager and the, the dispatchers that I worked with were amazing, top notch. No question. I love those people with all of my heart. It's why I'm doing this show, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I, I don't. I don't hold any ill will. I think it was just a t kind of a teachable moment for all of us to kind of to say, look, uh, there's a reason why you guys are all feeling the way you're feeling. Um, and again, I, I still say that if you if you run down the checklist of PTSD, you'll see a lot of you'll see a lot of reasons for a lot of these stupid little conflicts that we have. You'll see that it bleeds over into the key. What happens in the break room and in that uh, A shift fridge versus B shift fridge or night shift fridge versus day shift fridge, that spills over into the communications area and that becomes uh, microscopic. Like, well, she had 42 minutes on the console and now she's on the radio and, and it, it's, it's just a, an environment to be in. So uh, I think it's better to look for solutions than it is to just kind of you know, discipline your way out of it. It's it's what we do in criminal justice anyway. I mean, you're not going to arrest your way out of any problem. So why would you discipline your way out of any problem? Speaking of problems, there's a fellow named Enrique that I would like to go to. He lives in the, well, he's from a, he has a Florida area code. Uh, Enrique, I'm not sure that Enrique speaks English, but uh, apparently he's a first time caller, long time listener. Enrique, are you there? Hola, he's a first time caller, long time listener. Good to be on the show. We're so glad to have you. Um, Orlando, Orlando, Disney World. My, it's so awesome. Enrique, you sound very happy. And from what I gather, uh, because I do speak a little broken Spanish, you are in the Orlando area celebrating at Disney, perhaps. Daytona, new number one vacation spot, man. Enrique, you've turned uh, Jamaican almost, but uh, and Jamaican me crazy. So, what uh, what is the weather like over in Daytona and Disney or wherever you are? The weather is perfecto, my man. The sun is always shining and never the sun never sets on Florida. I love Florida. Uh, listen, this show got very dark very quick. When I called, it was very funny. It was very light. I had a Casey Anthony joke. Now I feel like an asshole. Probably not going to make the drowning joke. Uh, so, my apologies. You, my man. <laughs> Ron John Surf Shop, number one surf shop in Florida. Oh, my goodness. I thought DeVille Skate Shop was number one shop in Florida. And I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, Enrique, I, as soon as uh, I went down that dark road and I looked over and saw that you had called, I, I thought, darn, we have, we have blown an opportunity. No, but hey, for, for real, though, let me let me just say one quick real point. By the way, this is Eric wait, is Dancy. This Enrique, I is, this, is this I you all Go ahead. Yeah. No, this is Eric, dude. Frank call. Got you, right? <laughs> Got you. Tricked all of you. Uh, whatever the cop is that called, Internal Affairs on the Sleeping Cop, one, what an asshole. 
Um, two, I, I've always told my recruit, recruits that, that policing is not a normal job. And therefore, there's no, there is no nine to five. There's no seven to seven. There's no, say, like, if you're working 12 hours, 10 hours, whatever it is, that doesn't exist. You should never even put it in your brain that you work 12 hour shifts. When people say, hey, what do you work? I say, oh, I'm supposed to work seven to seven. But like, if you get in the mindset that you're seven to seven and you, you have any kind of hope in your brain that you're going to work a normal 12 hour shift and have normal days off, you set yourself up for failure. So I've always told my recruits, you don't work seven to seven. You're supposed to work seven to right. seven, which means at eight o'clock in the morning, you might be going to work at the courthouse because you got court today, or you might be working at one o'clock in the afternoon because you got to go to the range. So I've always said, man, sleep when you can sleep. And there ain't no shame in that game, dude. Like, it's so dangerous. I don't want to be going to a call with a zombie. So if you got to call a brother to come, hey, are you typing right now, homie? Yeah, I'm typing. Come type next to me, man, so I can get some sleep, man. I got court in the morning. I have never once shamed up. Matter of fact, though, we did take pictures of each other sleeping, but we had it in a group chat. And it was a collage of hilarious, drooling, one time they took my clip-on tie off me while I was sleeping and they submerged it and then they put it in the snow and they froze it. Uh, that was the night that it was snowing terribly here and I slept from 2 a.m. to about 6 a.m. I'm not going to say I didn't take advantage of it some, from time to time, but, you know, I, you, you sleep when you can sleep as long as you do it safely. But yeah. just saying that the seven is seven job to so grow the, you know, that supervisor needs to grow up and understand that his troops aren't working you know, just a regular shift, but, uh, yeah. And it's, yeah, fuck it's that guy. this, this was, uh, this was up in a communication center. So it's kind of even worse. Like the comparison is a little different because they're not allowed to have their phones or their tablets at the position. And, you know, so what are you going to do? Rely on a uh, sports illustrated to get you through a shift or, you know what I mean? So, um, so <laughs> you, you got adrenaline dump that you got to deal with, yes. you know, falling asleep yes. in a police officer job. I mean, within reason, I don't know, man. I just think it's, yeah. I, you know, I've had cops that are like, it's, it's like the, it's like the, the antichrist to fall asleep. You're not pulling security. I mean, if you can fall asleep safely, what's the difference in getting 20 minutes of sleep in your car than, than going into the, the donut shop, grabbing a donut, driving to the cul-de-sac and eating the donut on the hood of your car? Like, you're not serving the public eating your donut on the hood of the car in the cul-de-sac. We are. If, if there's no difference in eating the donut the hood of your car in your cul-de-sac and sleep it as long as you can do it safely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're on the same page. On that. We're definitely on the same page. I, I, I said the same thing about well, hey, earlier when I called, it was a much later show, but I, I appreciate all you guys are doing. I love you guys. I love you dispatchers. Keep doing the Lord's work. Hey man, I'm going to go get me a new sun. Dan run John surf shop, new number one surf shop in Daytona, Florida. Enrique's back. All right. Well, we will, we will deal with more Enrique tomorrow. Thank you for calling. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear Enrique tomorrow on the uh, the other show that we do. Uh, the, the name escapes. Okay, here's another. Here's something. Hey, Drew and John, it's April. Um, so I was just, you know, looking at John's Instagram story, and he had a poll up there on who was the worst 911 caller. And one of the options is a nurse, of course. And as a nurse, I jokingly hit nurse. And I was, uh, you know not at all shocked to see that 100% of the people agreed with me that nurses are the worst 911 callers. And, you know, I just, I resemble that, um, you know, in the hundred times in my life that I've had to call 911, I have been horrible at it. And so I guess I just wanted to take the time to leave a message and just apologize on behalf of myself, my profession. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you can forgive us. All right. Have a good show. April, I do forgive you, and I do forgive the entire medical profession. Anybody who has that uh, staff with the snake thing around it is uh, is forgiven in my eyes. John, what about you? Well, first of all, I thank you for being the first person to vote on the poll. That's probably why you saw that it, nurses uh, took the cake. But uh, it's it's actually already down. I just checked it. But actually, surprisingly, uh, regular people won that poll. And I all I can tell you is that if you voted for regular people as the worst 911 callers, not only are you wrong, but if you're a first responder, you need to look deep inside yourself and find some more fault. Uh, I think I think it's honestly it's really hard. It's it's a tie. You know, uh, some police officers will call me off duty, say, hey, I've got a guaranteed DUI here. And then it's nothing. Or I've got a firefighter here who doesn't know the address of a house that's on fire. 
or he needs uh, just so many things. I guess I don't want to trash firefighters because that's just too easy. Um, but I gar- I tell you now that if you are in the field, whether you're a nurse, police officer, or a firefighter, you make a terrible 911 caller. And I can tell you who makes the best 911 callers, and that's 911 dispatchers. Even earlier this evening, I was involved in a serious vehicular accident, and I called no one. I took care of it myself. So 911 dispatchers, this one's for you for being the best 911 callers. Those who don't call at all, thank you. <laughs> that's no joke either. Uh, he He evaded death. Or maybe death evaded him once again, but uh, there's still time. He he miraculously showed up in the live stream just before we went live, just before the director got into my ear and said, hey, we're going live, but I think John's here. I actually Uh, have an an IV right over here, so yeah, I'm okay. That's good. Uh, You do look peaked, but that's very normal for you. Uh, Here's another sun in months, yeah. Hey, Drew, and John, this is Jim from Florida, just calling to uh, give you some feedback on the Aurora, Illinois case, as well as the most recent with Amanda. Both were very poignant, very relevant, very well explored. Uh, I really appreciate Amanda's openness on the topic of mental health. I think a lot of people need to hear that. And uh, it's very amazing that she is a survivor and uh my prof squad to her thank you guys for what you're doing bye um our show with amanda i thought was very very for uh, uh, because of what amanda said not necessarily because of, of our production you know i'm not trying to uh, put myself over here but i think she did an amazing job but i think that she did something uh very um uh, she, she opened the dam and you and I, and, in, in uh, uh, dead Lake media, Josh, were, were talking about this before we went on the air. Davey probably heard the whole thing. Uh, she kind of opened the dam. She kind of broke the dam and that's exactly what we needed. That's what we, we wanted someone to do. I, I don't necessarily think that we need to be heavy in every call or, or on, uh, on every show, but my God, she, uh, she bore her soul and it, it was, uh, you know, what some people might uh, consider a sacrifice of humility. She just, she's just trying to show you that, you know, there, there is, there is a bottom, but you can definitely get back on top and she's uh, doing what she can to get there. And, and not every day is sunshine and roses for her, but um, by God, she's going to try. And um, she's doing, she's not just alive. She's thriving. And, uh, you know, she was from the brink of suicide. So we also got, a uh, from the, uh, we got a direct message. It said, um, about that episode specifically, this was an amazing episode. It brought me to tears. First responders, veterans, dispatchers, et cetera, need to hear more stories like this stories of overcoming and survival. she was articulate, honest, and genuine. I'm enjoying the shows. Keep up the good work. John's beard is epic. I may have added that last part. So um, you know, keep those, uh, keep those coming in. We need the encouragement. We need the, uh, we need to let Amanda know that she, uh, is making a difference in this world because it's hard to get validation sometimes when you're, uh, bearing your soul like that. But, uh, man, uh, what an impactful show. I, I urge you to go back, uh, four episodes. If you're listening to this as a uh, podcast, subtract four and go, um, to that Amanda episode. I think it's called uh, returning from the brink or something to that effect. Back from and, the uh, break. I like alliteration back, drew back from the brink. No, back uh, from the breaking point. It's even better. Back from the breaking but... point. All right. So, uh, and, and, and go back and, and I'm glad you definitely uh, happy that you busted up my rhythm there. So just, just make sure you go back and listen to that, download it and uh, listen to what Amanda has to say and follow her. Uh, but more importantly, follow her lead because I think it is equally as important that you understand um, as a dispatcher, you understand as a as a uh, first responder that those those little things on the PTSD checklist um, they'll sneak up on you, and and when you're checking two and three off or four and five and six and seven things off on that on that checklist, it's it's time to check yourself. It's time to to dump the bucket out, so to speak, and, and, um, get yourself right, because it's just going to lead you down a, a, 
a very unholy path, so to speak. So um, just uh, just be aware of it. And and that's kind of what we're here to do, spread the awareness and, and hopefully uh, help you get help. Yeah, that show with uh, Amanda was amazing and uh, just really glad that she came on to tell us all about it. There's really nothing more than I can that can add to that incredible story. And I know that uh, she's she still struggles and she probably always will. So just don't feel like uh, if you're struggling that uh, there's a finish line for you, you know, it might be more reasonable to think this is something I'm always going to deal with. And certainly uh, people, uh, first responders, police officers, dispatchers, we're always as long as we're in the fight, we're always going to be dealing with that. So keep your chin up and reach out if you need help and find find some way to to win that fight a separate we're gonna go to our uh to to the main portion of the show what uh just to summarize briefly uh because there are a couple points that i want to hit in this thing um we uh i I pulled this from um it's called the pima county there's a an acronym for it but what happens in an officer involved shooting there is there is uh there's representation from six or seven offices that that work uh, in that area, like the the county sheriff, the the local police departments, the local university police, and what they've done is they've formed like an investigative kind of by committee, so that when one of the agencies gets into a use of deadly force or an officer involved shooting of some sort, the committee does the investigation and the involved agency recuses themselves. It's it, it's a pretty good system in my opinion. It it keeps uh, the checks and the balances and then to, to take it a little bit further into the transparency area they they publish what they find and uh, this is actually still an active investigation as of the time I pulled the video but uh, what this uh, is is uh, something that dispatchers deal with quite frequently um, it's a person calling 911 to tell them that um, they're kind of in crisis without saying those words and uh, you know then then we'll see after that we'll see the police response so let's just go to of investigation here. of right. south prudence road near prudence and 22nd street after 11 p.m the tucson public safety communications department received a 911 call from a man making statements about ending his own life here's an excerpt from the 911 call condensed for this video what is the address of the emergency i, I just have a question for you guys like, like if 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 I were to shoot myself in the head right now, like how 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 bad would that be? Okay, I don't really know the answer to that question. Let me get you in touch with someone who can help you. Okay, stay on the line. Sure. It, it'd be pretty bad, right? Hollow tip nines, right? <laughs> Where do you live at? <laughs> you can't know that. Then it, it's just a secret. <laughs> Well, what can I help you with? What's going on tonight? Everything's f***ed. Everything's f***ed. This life is f***ed. I'm not even supposed to be alive. I'm not even supposed to be alive. I should have died last year. But for some reason, someone brought me back to life. But I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it all right now. Like, there's no way you're going to bring me back from this night. Why don't you talk to me and we'll see what we can do to get you some help. I, I got the help right here in my hand. I don't, I'm not here that guy. Okay. Well, have you gotten help before? Oh, plenty. Of, I've been dealing with this sh- for years. You're, this, <laughs> do you have a weapon on you? Yeah, I've got multiple weapons on me. Of course. Okay, what do you have? Two nine mils. <laughs> What's your first oh, name? Gosh. I've done this multiple times. I'm done with it. I'm ready to end it. Crisis isn't going to help me, and they're going to send me to CRC where I can sit in a reclining chair and be uncomfortable and sit around a bunch of crazy people while they tell me to take my meds. I'm done with it. There's no meds to help me. While on the phone with 911, the man was transferred to mental health professionals to receive additional assistance. During that phone call with the mental health professionals, the man's behavior escalated and information came in that the man had a firearm. So just imagine uh, you, the civilian, or you, the the cop, or whatever, um, 
are sitting there at your 911 con the console and without warning, a little beep goes off in your ear and you hear that. Uh, I see comments in, in here that, you know, he sounds intoxicated. Uh, he gave indication that uh, he shouldn't even be alive. So a year ago, somebody brought him back from the dead, which is uh, to me an indicator of perhaps uh, like a fentanyl or, or maybe a heroin overdose. And he was an Narcan. Um, it's just me, you know, completely guessing uh, it could be something completely different, but uh, this is a frequent call, John, is it not where somebody calls to kind of say, look, I'm getting ready to end it. Yeah, actually I would take the remark about how having been saved or he shouldn't be alive is uh, I would, I would take that as he's previously had a serious suicide, suicide attempt, which is part of the battery of questions when you, you ask someone who is uh, expressing suicidal ideation, if they've had an attempt before, what was their mode? Uh, so that, that's what I would be worried about. Also, his affect is all over the place. You know, he seems distraught. Uh, you know, the giggling is certainly, it's not a, about him seeing humor in the situation, but this is a guy that has been on the phone with 911 many, many, many times. And uh, he knows all the questions that are coming. He knows uh, that, it, that there's a certain game to be played here. And so this is very, very atypical from someone who's in first time distress. This is someone who's been down this road many times. It's a state of mental health in the United States, by the way. I mean, he, he knows the game. He knows, uh, look, you're not going to take me to whatever facility. It, it, you, there, are this, there is this type of caller in every jurisdiction, several. And, you know, you know, we make joke of the frequent flyer or whatever, but, but that's a real thing. And um, he, he's saying this time it's not going to work. I'm not going to go sit at, you know, whatever ward and, and there's no medication that's going to help me here. And, and, you know, um, I, I see a good question in the, uh, in the comments from chief Keith. He wants to know if there are actual mental health professionals, uh, in the communication center, John, do you have that where you work? Well, my center's too small to employ anyone who's specifically a, a mental health professional. We have, uh, just a kind of a standardized procedure for how to deal with that. Um, it's a lot of it's different than the training that I've had as a, a hostage negotiator or a barricaded subject. Uh, so it's, you, you generally stick with your SOPs as a dispatcher because operating as a dis, as a negotiator at that time would be outside of your scope. But uh, well, we, we don't have anybody. And I think that's probably the state of things in most dispatch centers throughout uh, America is we simply don't have anyone on the staff. I think that that's great that they, they had that person that could be on that call. And I'm sure it's related to the dispatcher that you can have someone in there. And you almost feel like a more of a, a, spe a specific professional or a, uh, you know, a specialist or a technician is taking over at that point. Uh, I'm going to share a little story. This, this story, this is a story we didn't get to on the uh, tales of disrespect when we did our episode, because it was such a bad technical nightmare. I'd, I'd really want to get back to that, but uh, we were having a discussion one morning, uh, in a, I, I happen to be in, in an executive staff situation. Um, I was just there representing the communication center for a morning meeting. And, um, we were talking about mental health and mental health crises, just like this one. And, uh, I said, uh, b because our, uh, the agency that I worked for was, uh, creating like this robust mental health response program where, you know, we were having mental health, uh, practitioners kind of ride along, or at least they were centralized along with deputies to kind of, um, you know, to check on those frequent flyers that we keep talking about. Um, and I said, you know, just on a whim, I said, you know, it probably wouldn't hurt to have people mental health, trained mental health counselors sitting right up in the communication center. And, and one colonel's eyes got really big and he looked at me and, and full of common sense and said, you know, that's a great idea. And the other one who, unfortunately, I worked directly for said, you don't want that without explanation. Uh, so I guess we don't want that. Uh, why would we want mental health help for anybody else? So um, that's, that's kind of that's the daily battle of uh, working in a communi communication center. Perhaps it was just me, the messenger, who, <laughs> but whatever. That information was relayed to Tucson Police Department to respond to the location. Tucson police officers from Operations Division East responded to an apartment complex near Prudence and 22nd Street to speak with the man. 
As officers arrived at the complex, they began searching for the man. During the search, the man was seen carrying a firearm in the parking lot. Officers gave commands to the man to drop the weapon. After the commands were given, the man ran out of sight from officers and fired around in an unknown direction. The man continued east to west through the complex towards South Prudence Road. Additional officers were waiting in the area and the man emerged from the complex wearing a tactical vest and holding two handguns. One of the officers fired his department issued rifle, striking the man. Once the scene was safe, officers began rendering first aid using their individual first aid kit or IFAC for short until Tucson Fire Department arrived. TFD transported the man to a local hospital with life-threatening injuries. At the time of this video release, the man remains at the hospital and he is out of critical condition. Here is body-worn camera footage of the first responding officer who gave commands to the man to drop the weapon prior to him firing in an unknown direction. Eli, you need to drop the weapon! Drop the weapon! Eli, you are going to be shot! Drop the weapon! They're taking cover behind concrete by a mailbox, set of mailboxes. And they're trying their dialogue to, to get him to drop the guns, obviously. I got him over here. He's walking westbound. They start running towards where he is. One officer says, what's the plan? Walking west. Walking west. Hey, hold. Here's a video excerpt from the apartment complex's surveillance system. So a man's walking through. He's got a tactical vest on. This is outside an apartment complex. There's cars. You don't see anyone else but him so far. Very hurriedly walking through, kind of matter of factly. Other police officers are kind of converging on his location, looking for him. Suspects kind of moving at a, almost at a right angle in direction of the officer, moving through the parking lot. This is at nighttime after midnight on Sunday morning. So I'm sure there's plenty of people in the apartment complex. Suspects moving towards the officer now. The officer seems more or less stationary. Here's a video excerpt from the involved TPD officer. <laughs> Officer has rifle in his hand, moving from low to high ready. He's looking through a fence into the parking lot. He saw someone took the shot. I'm done. There's a gun there near the suspect. Okay. I had to wait for him to clear the officer. The man has been identified as 21-year-old Elijah Dixon. Here's a photograph of the two firearms that Mr. Dixon was holding. Looks like two 9 mils. The Tucson police officer that fired his rifle has been identified as Officer Matthew Mertz, a 23-year veteran with the department. The Pima Regional Critical Incident Team continues to investigate this incident. When the investigation is complete, it will be presented to the Pima County Attorney's Office for review. Members of the public with information and or video of the incident are asked to contact the Pima County Sheriff's Department at 520-351-4900. Okay, so if you do have information, please call that Pima uh, Critical Incident Team 1. And 2, uh, I didn't really mean to identify the guy. I, I, I don't, you know, in this line of work, when you're walking around with two guns and a attack vest, it doesn't necessarily always mean you're a bad guy as, as horrible as that's going to sound to a bunch of cops that are probably in their car beating a steering wheel, uh, hearing me say that, but th th this guy is obviously in some type of crisis. Now there's a small debate in the, in the, uh, in, in the chats as to whether this was a quote suicide by cop or not. Um, and there is a good, there's a valid argument. If this were suicide by cop, why would he have a attack vest on? So, he he's made his intentions known that he does want to die. He's made his intentions known that he has that he's armed and he's walking through an apartment complex. He fired the gun in an unknown direction. Who knows if he fired it in the air? I don't know if any of the officers witnessed that, but they heard the gunshot. And when the officer 
had a clear shot. He he took he took his shot to neutralize a uh, a dangerous suspect because uh, let's not forget the uh, the criteria for uh, use of deadly force is uh, imminent threat of death or great bodily harm to yourself or anyone else. And if you've got an apartment complex full of people and you've got a guy walking around with a tack vest and two nine millimeters who is uh, pining for death, I, I would say that that's an imminent threat. Uh, but that's uh, definitely on a uh, on uh, other people to kind of make that full decision and people would have who had the full facts. I, I, I really didn't mean to identify the person involved in this thing. Hopefully he, uh, he got the help that he needed. Um, and it is my understanding that he recovered, uh, from, from this incident or he is still in the hospital. One. one thing to remember too, is that regardless of his intent, whether he, you know, really did want to draw fire from an officer or he was out to do ill will, you got to remember that, there's some strict liability going on for how reckless he's being with that firearm. He is shooting it in an apartment complex where you presume people are sleeping after midnight on a Sunday morning. And ultimately, the police have a responsibility to protect that man, but they have a responsibility to protect everyone else. And police officers arriving on scene can't sit here and uh, have psychic powers trying to figure out that this guy is in the midst of a crisis or he's calling out for help. Once the situation goes tactical, once shots are being fired, Unfortunately, he's taking the situ he's taking the decision out of the officer's hands. And it really is unfortunate because this phenomenon of subject precipitated suicide is something that's really baffling people in terms of hostage negotiation, in terms of police policy. You know, what is your responsibility? And ultimately it's to preserve life. And uh, if you're preserving the lives of the people in that complex or other other officers there, unfortunately, the equation is always going to be that you're better off. Uh, taking out the person who's putting other people at risk. Um, when the first time I heard this call, I was actually just getting off of shift to get ready for the show. And first thing I felt as an M1 dispatcher was anger because this is exactly the sort of call coming into the comm center. Someone saying they that they want to kill themselves and they can't be dissuaded. Um, you know, just his affect, whether it was a genuine reflection of his feelings or not, that it was a, a joke to him or his life didn't matter. Well, you're involving other people at that point. And I don't, I'm not advising anyone to just commit suicide or to do it on your own, but this takes a toll on 911 dispatchers because they're being invited into the the personal things that are going on with this guy. Uh, they're, you know, the dispatchers who took this call, the police officers had to respond to this call. They now have a shared trauma that's part of this guy's life story. You know, police officers don't want to respond to this. They don't want to shoot anybody. Dispatchers don't want to take this call. This is one of the worst calls you could take as an I one dispatcher. I know we say that a lot on this show, but it's like a competition for what could be the worst call. So I feel for the 911 dispatchers that have to listen to this guy um, inviting them into his world and the police officers who have to show up and deal with them. And uh, unfortunately, I don't I don't necessarily have a great answer for what you do other than just preserve as much life as you can. So I'm going to ask you some uh, pointed questions because I want to paint the picture for the people listening or watching. John, what's the, uh, we'll go on a scale of one to 10. What's the adrenaline level of the emergency call taker who's trying to talk this guy down from crisis? Well, I, it starts high um, because, you know, you can immediately tell that he's been through every, every part of this call before. So you just know like, man, this guy's not going to deescalate in my first five questions. I can't ask him to uh, tell me about the last time he was in crisis. What worked to help him de-escalate him last time? I can't ask him about, um, uh, you know, has this happened to him before? I can't ask him about maybe his previous attempts. I can't. He's going to know the script. And in fact, I've had a, a suicidal caller before where I start going through the script and they're just, they were very cynical and very jaded and very put off by that. And they're like, and uh, I, I immediately just sort of abandoned the script. I said, listen, you, you've called before. You've been through this. You know exactly what I'm going to ask you. And she goes, yeah, and I, I know you don't really care. I'm like, well, I'll tell you what, you know what? You know that it's my job to talk to you, to try to buy some time to get somebody there who can help you. I do care about what's going on with you. Uh, and I'm on the line with you and you have time with me. So you might as well use it however you want because you're in control of the situation as they are when they hold their life in their own hands. And just this is your chance. You can tell me what's going on with you or you don't have to. There's no way I can make you do anything. And I think she was actually sort of impressed with the frankness and honesty. And it's kind of a leap for dispatchers to take that. And I'm, I'm not necessarily advising anyone to do that. But when you have someone on the line who's this experienced at it, it immediately ratchets up because you don't think that you're going to be able to save this one. 
number between one and ten? Uh, I would say three, rising to maybe about eight. By the time he's laughing, uh, you're you're pretty upset as a dispatcher. Okay, so the often overlooked, in my opinion, uh, scale of one to ten of the adrenaline of the dispatcher that's on the radio that is not only dispatching the call but listening to. Okay, I'm 1097, and I think I see him walking west. Well, in a, in a dark confrontation, and you've got your police officers out there now, and uh, I'm not sure what the dispatchers knew other than that he had two weapons, but as a 911 dispatcher, you can't help but feel like you've, you've assisted in forcing this confrontation. You've got your police officers out there who are on your side. They're on your team. They're usually people that you uh, know and respect and even like, and you're putting them up against this guy that, and again, not to be callous, but you would almost rather have him do what he's going to do in the privacy of his own home without putting anyone in danger. Suicide and homicide are two sides of the same coin. And the last thing you want is to lose the suspect who called in, but you also don't want one of your police officers to go out with him. Uh, sending a police officer to something like this, I would be at a full 10. Yeah, I think I'd be at a full 10 too, because we, we have the benefit of the post um the after the fact video where, you know, they're, they're, t they're behind cover or they're behind a, a gate and concrete and, you know, with a long rifle, but you don't have that. Uh, you're painting the own pic your own picture in your own mind uh, when you're working that radio and you're just trying to keep everybody quiet and, and, <laughs> and you're sitting on pins and needles, literally waiting to hear what the next chess move is going to be. So I'll chip in uh, a, um, uh, some of the fear of uh, the be, between one and 10 uh, you're probably uh, on the way there. You're probably at a seven, you know, this guy's armed and you know that he wants to die. You arrive and you hear uh, gunshots, you go straight to a 10. And I, I, you know, I feel for the 23 year veteran who uh, has been trained to do this, but perhaps maybe doesn't uh, doesn't want to, but does. Uh, because that's what he's uh, he or she's been trained to do or he and uh, took aim and uh, just you know there's a lot of responsibility that comes with taking that shot because you know that this is uh, this is a use of deadly force situation therefore this is going to end somebody's life if if you if if it's if the bullet hits in the right spot one and two you don't know where the bullet's going to go after or you don't know where the bullet's going to go if you miss and you're in a crowded apartment complex you got co cops crawling everywhere so i'd say just about everybody every cop there is probably at an eight if not a 10 but most are at an eight because they're reserving some of their uh brain power and energy just in case the worst happens um but it's very hard to keep your cool so uh, this is why, and, and people criticize the early retirement of police officers and firefighters, when you get an adrenaline dump or an adrenaline rush like that, you're, you're talking about years on your life in minutes of time. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because um, towards the end of your career, if, if you've experienced those 600 traumatic events, like this would be a highly traumatic event. Uh, whereas the average human's only going to experience 20 in their maybe in their lifetime, uh, and you know you've experienced a 600. Obviously, there's an accelerated uh, it, what it does to your body and your heart. Um, there's there's obvious uh, damage that's done. What is overlooked and what is uh, often left behind are the dispatchers who feel the exact same adrenaline. They feel the exact same trauma. It's just that they're not in the exact same danger because it's uh, because they're not going to be hit by the bullets. Yeah, it's 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 tough, and it's uh, I'm just glad for that veteran officer that it didn't end up going down as uh, somebody that he killed. Uh, that's not what he's there to do. We have uh, I do see Hydraman Blue in the queue. Uh, we have Chief Keefe who's on the line, uh, and I'm sure wants to talk about what we were just talking about. What's uh, what's going on there, Chief Keefe? Oh, fellas, great show as always. Thank you, my man. So I uh, j just wanted to hit, uh, this is one thing, I mean, I know failure to stop is, is geared more toward law enforcement, and we all bust each other's balls about firemen, police, but this is a type of call that honestly puts us on the exact same page for once. You know, you guys deal with stuff that we don't have to deal with, but we get this call, we're both, you know, on the scene there trying to figure it out, right? So we've got, you know, a mental health issue a potential violent issue 
and not knowing which way it's going to go. And at the flip of a coin, you may have to jump in or we may have to jump in or we collaborate and do it together. And that's something, at least where I'm from, we do a really good job of collaborating our stuff together on these types of runs and then educating our young folks on how to deal with it. Uh, please, please save him. I'm sure is one of the thoughts that are uh, is going through the guy who took the shot. I mean, I, I'm not speaking for him. Maybe he doesn't think this way at all. Um, I, I know that there are certain branches of the service that train to just kill, kill, kill. But uh, there are probably other people on the planet that are just like, man, I, I, I had to do what I had to do. I just, I, I prefer this guy not to die. I mean, um, so right. they're relying on you to um, render the the appropriate aid. Of course, they. Um, they immediately jumped into action and they tried to save the guy because that's that's what cops do. By the way, um, we're uh, we're trained to to neutralize the threat, but we're also trained first responders, as in literal first responders. So it, we might have to provide first aid. That's that first and first responder. So um, just as long as we do the uh, life sustaining efforts until the the proper medical professionals like Chief Keith can get there. And then they can assess and then they can move them or transport them to wherever they go. But uh, it's harrowing because I'm sure you're feeling an extra sense of pressure from the cops that are there as well. Yeah. And, and ideally, I mean, we don't get to that point and, and you know, between, you know, the police and the, and the firemen paramedics de-escalating it. I ideally is what we want. All right, let's get you to walk out to the cot. Then we'll take you. Yeah. You may go on a three day vacation on a hold on a pink slip, but I'd much rather that than, you know, a police officer having to discharge a firearm because now you now have another, you have now have another mental issue potentially on top of, you know, the initial, you know, the initial call. Right. Exactly. Um, Chief Keefe can be heard on uh, one more and I'm out of here. It's a podcast. They, uh, they dropped another one today. They're just, uh, they're machines, those guys. Uh, and speaking of n- something that's not average, way above average is our friend, uh, Abby Ellsworth, who has her own podcast on being a police officer. She has previously featured John and, uh, even before that myself, Abby, how are you this evening? I'm good guys. How are you? Great show. Well, thank you. I have a question. Go for it. So this is a genuine, honest question. When the officer says, drop your weapon or I'll shoot you to a suicidal subject, I, I know the officer has to protect himself and other potential civilians, but I don't understand that command under those circumstances. This is a, a genuinely... And, and is this not a situation where you'd call CIT or HNT or it's too fast moving? It is too fast moving because the, the, the threat is way too imminent. I think it could be a, uh, okay. like a, a, a training, like a repetition thing. Like that's just what you say kind of thing. Uh, but uh, there's probably also an element that uh, when you're trying to establish dialogue as they, as they had, it, I mean, you know, they showed the pattern of trying to establish dialogue with them. Um, if you, it, that's, that's kind of like one last appeal. It, it's like, listen, maybe this one last phrase will snap him back into a reality that if he does not drop that gun, the reality is I'm going to have to shoot him. Um, and, and, yeah. you know, we, we definitely don't want to be in a situation where, uh, we're second to the, to the party when it comes to shooting, uh, as callous as that may sound, it's, um, I was taught very early on in my uh, training by one of our SWAT guys. It's uh, the, the first well-placed round wins the battle. So, um, you know, mm-hmm. that warning, um, even our SOPs uh, where I worked covered that, you know, when feasible, you should give a warning before firing your, your shot. Sometimes it's not feasible, but, um, you know, it, I guess they saw the feasibility there and maybe it was just one last appeal. That's my my guess. John, do you have a different take on that? Well, it's just part of the use of force continuum. You know, the officer's there, that's part one, and then verbal commands are part two. And also, you know, if it becomes necessary to shoot, as Drew just ad- addressed, you know, a verbal command to cease and desist is going to help you legally. But suppose this, suppose he had said to the guy, I dropped a gun or I'll shoot you. And the guy drops the gun. Well, I mean, callous or, yeah. you know, if it, if it works, it works. If you no. can tell the guy to do it and he complies, then all the better. You know, 
Uh, Daniel right. Carr, I know you're you're probably going to have a conversation with Daniel Carr in the near future, and maybe you already have, but uh, he's he's got his own uh, <laughs> situation going on. Police law news. Uh, I'm a big I'm a huge fan of Daniel Carr, but um, he put something out the other day that, and and we ended up discussing it. Um, you know, uh, there there was a there was a federal law enforcement officer who uh, claimed that in her academy she was taught that using the word stop resisting was just to cover for them while they beat the shit out of whoever they're trying to arrest. And there's, there's, that's not true. The, the, the term stop resisting is actually to get the person to stop resisting. That's why we say it. Um, and I think that there may be some misconceptions, especially put out by people who have failed in law enforcement that, you know, just yelling stop resisting is just good for the camera. And that may be true. But it's also dialogue. It's also to get the person to stop resisting. So I, I always uh, want to counter that with, um, well, maybe uh, maybe we'll stop saying stop resisting for your camera if you quit saying I can't breathe and I'm dying and they're killing me and um, you know if you're truly if you're tr- if you truly can't breathe I don't know that you can be yelling that loud and if you're really not dying or are you getting this on film or, uh, you know, it, it too can play at this game. It's, it's, it seems that it's okay for the Academy Awards to consider the defendant who's yelling, I can't breathe. And that's going to get played over and over again. But when the police officer actually gives a warning, such as literally drop your gun, or I'm literally going to shoot you, uh, somehow we're the villain. And that's that. They do. Okay, thank you, guys. Yeah. You're thank right. Thank you very much for calling, Abby. I appreciate you being here. You're right, though, Drew. Like, they do you bet. The, the camera, and a lot of that goes on these days where I think you guys covered a, on Failure to Stop recently where a woman live streamed her, her boyfriend in the car being shot by a police officer. And instead of rendering aid or doing anything for him, she just live streamed it. So pe- these days, people are always uh, uh, conscious that a, that a camera is looking and they go, they, they almost go on stage when that sort of thing goes on. We've kind of conditioned them to be prepared for the uh, uh, lawsuit and, and to get the best uh, footage for the jury, as opposed to the humanity of the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's horrible when an officer has to fire a gun and, uh, it's horrible when uh, that the whatever the officer fires, um, you know, strikes something. Let's end on a happy note. How about that? We're going to go to uh, somebody who has. Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, we have two calls. Hold on one second. Uh, Hydraman, I'm I, I'm just saying, 25 seconds. I, I want to know if your flagpole situation has been fixed. My flagpole is flying high and proud, brother. What I want to know is when are the ice cream trucks coming back? It's cold, man. I want some ice cream. Oh, I, I don't blame you. Uh, are, are the ice cream trucks not operating? I, I don't. Hold on. Let me check my CAD screen here. Uh, yes, I do see that they are out of service for the season. So hopefully uh, we, we will get an Indian summer of some sorts and there will be a Mr. Softy in your neighborhood be uh, sooner than later. All right. All right. What about some shaved ice? Can I at least get some shaved ice? Hawaiian oh, shaved ice. Is that correct? Yeah. John, uh, do me a favor and uh, hook uh, Hydraman Blue up with Josh, who can provide him with some uh, recipes for ice. Hydraman, you're always uh, an all-star in the, in the calls. And uh, I can't thank you enough for calling, and I can't thank you enough for sitting there all that time. Uh, Godspeed, and we will get you ice cream as soon as possible. We have another call coming in, and it is, uh, I am so happy to report that Micah is uh, calling on the line. Uh, Micah named his child after uh, this show. After this show, yeah. And I want to hear what Micah has to say, because I always like what Micah has to say. Hi, hi, how's it going, guys? Howdy. What's up? Can you hear me? Okay. All is well. I just want to say, uh, obviously, I have a slightly different experience uh, dealing with people, um, having conversations, much like that phone call. I just, 
I've heard very similar, had very similar conversations, and people have been able to um, be de-escalated and uh, be put in a safer situation. And, and I've seen, uh, had conversations like that where people, um, <clears throat> not quite the same result, but it didn't go well. Um, and I just, I think there's not enough personal responsibility on the person. Um, clearly, this young man made that decision. And it's kind of like the, the joke, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? But the, the number doesn't matter, but the light bulb has to want to change. Oh, yeah. So. Great point. Uh, well, first, first, excellent point, Micah. First, I would like to say domo origato, Mr. Roboto. Uh, but second, you do bring some very poignant points. You, you've got to be willing to change. And, and uh, you know what? The, I think the odd thing about this call, too, is... Yeah, he knows the procedure, but he also knows to call 911 for some reason. You know what I mean? Like maybe he is reaching out for right. that last uh that last thread of hope or um you know there there was a, some something or someone made him call and uh and and he called. Yep. All right. Yeah, I just wish he uh he had made some different decisions, but thanks again guys. I uh, appreciate you taking my call. All right. Get some sleep, Micah. You. Get some sleep, Micah. We have somebody by the name of Andrea, and I think it's going to be the same, Andrea. And uh, we are ecstatic and excited because we tried to go to you the last time we were taking calls, but we didn't necessarily make that connection. But here's the star of the show, Andrea. Hey, (laughs) y'all. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all doing? (laughs) We're doing great. I'm doing great. John is uh, John has got the blues a little bit, and uh, he dodged death. I don't know if you heard the story or not, but uh, he's uh, he's barely here. But he he's did. I actually, I was a I was a horrible, horrible friend, and when I found out that he had to dig his vehicle out of a snowy embankment, I sent him a picture of the sunset and the azaleas as I was walking to a neighbor's house this evening. Um, that wasn't nice of me. I don't know that that could have uh, saved this show because it may have uh, brought him back into a Zen moment to be able to sit down and put those headphones on and uh, brush that scraggly beard and uh, talk to the, uh, the the fine people of the of the wolf pack. Of the Seriously, wolf pack. Seriously well, though, Andrea, both my legs y'all. are broken. I... So <laughs> say that again. What did John. you say? I said, seriously, Andrea, both my legs are broken. <laughs> then I'm glad I could provide you with a sunset to view. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, y'all, it's been a great show. I was just going to comment on the um, the first case that you showed with the um, child receiving CPR. And a lot of us were talking about that in the chat. But man, I felt like that dispatcher did a fantastic job of not only being calm, but almost even upbeat is probably the wrong word. I mean, but absolutely the opposite of anxious in tone. Confident. I felt like confident. I, I do. I, I'm glad that you brought that. Yeah, back very up. confident. I, I forgot to cover this. Uh, I, I'm glad that you brought that back up. There, there is the thing that I always go to that John subtly makes fun of me for, which is uh, the. Uh, repetitive persistence which is something you're taught uh young as, as a dispatcher just just be uh repetitive and be persistent just help is on the way help is on the way just keep saying it over and over again because it's eventually going to sink in there are also protocol sheets or, or pr- protocol cards they're probably now uh port protocol tabs or t- protocol screens where mm-hmm. they're specifically reading things right off of uh off of the script so it it takes some of the mystery out of or it takes some of the uh crisis out of the crisis if you will so that supervisor who's probably memorized this uh a thousand times over you know probably been tenured and experienced but is probably just reading off of the script saying, okay, now I want you to remove the baby, lay it on its side in case the water's coming. But those are probably literal words that are uh, written out for them. Probably, but I mean, the tone conveys everything, you know, and you can read that, like you said, without confidence, right. and it's going gonna, it's gonna to convey an entirely different message. Right. And, um, and keeping a cool head is what's going to keep their head cool. And, and obviously, you know, it's a frantic moment and, and they were still frantic, but they were able to do to follow his instructions. So you're 
uh, you're as yeah. they say on uh, one more and I'm out of here a hundred percent. Right. Um, you know, mission accomplished. Uh, that, that was a, that's a great observation. Two leap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I won't keep y'all. I know it's getting late and you're winding it down, but I wanted to say hello and y'all did a great job tonight. And we all look forward to seeing all you guys in April, whoever's coming. So hit the like button if you haven't everybody. Oh, uh, thank you. Hit the like button, share this with your aunt Sally. Uh, thank you. Uh, hold on a second. I think I hit the wrong button, but thank you very much, Andrea, for calling. Uh, we're just about going to wrap this up. John, do you have anything to, for the good of the order before we close it? Yeah. I just wanted to thank everybody and for the super chats tonight. And I'm, I know I'm not going to get everybody, but I wanted to thank David who donated a couple times. Uh, Dead Slough Act Amend Carey, who I'm sorry, I never get your name right. Uh, we also had Britt donate some and Micah, our caller earlier, donated some. But also, the thing that I thought was awesome today was just how many phone calls. You know, that kind of makes up for the times when we're not really able to get to that. But we had both Eric and Andrea call in tonight. I mean, that's 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 a, a new kind of precedent. And we just want to say thank you to not only our coworkers at Failure Stop, but everybody who supports us. Make sure you you download, hit like, subscribe. Like Drew says, tell your Aunt Sally or whoever. And uh, that helps keep us going, helps us climb the charts, helps us uh, remember what we're fighting for, which is you guys, because we want to make a show that's for 911 dispatchers and first responders of all kinds, even firefighters. And uh, we appreciate you guys sticking with us as we move through Failure to Stop 2.0. We're three months in and uh, it's been fun so far and I've, I've been enjoying it and it's been a great opportunity. If you're a uh, if you're a cop, I'm an or a cop or a firefighter. I'm an issue a challenge to you. I want you to tell two dispatchers about this show, and I want them to tune in with you the next uh, next go around on Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 7 Central. If you're a dispatcher, I want you to tell four uh, cops and um, uh, and firefighters, and and don't tell me you're not in communication with them because you. Uh, obviously control their destiny. So if they decide that they're not going to um, tune into this show at your uh, request, you could always send them to the worst uh, sexual battery call when they only have 20 minutes left in their shift. So uh, for difficult to look at pictures on Instagram, I am drew uh, underscore B R E A S Y drew breezy. That's me. Definitely turn it, tune in next Thursday at eight. Thanks for being here, John. Stick around. Good night.